Right. Thank you. Look, uh, first of all, thank you to TTRA for um, giving us this opportunity to share what we've been working on for for many years. And so uh, we've been focused on visualization, though you might not have known it for the past three to four years. And I'd like to just give a preamble to all the work that we've done. Then I'll hand it over to my esteemed colleagues for um, for really the the genius behind our um, or at least the genius behind our approach to visualization a genius that I give them credit for <laughs> and take less of myself so if you uh, ping me if you can't see my screen but this is our visualization master class sponsored by Horizon and Horizon is in case you haven't seen it yet Horizon is the next iteration of um, a rivalist reporting platform so for today's uh, presentation, we will feature first Bala, our head of analytics. Bala's been with the company eight years now and has ingested more books on visualization than anybody I personally know. Um, he's also a, an avid soccer fan and one of the best practitioners of Brazilian mixed martial arts in Canada. I mean, I know that. After that, uh, Jeff Summerson is our head of product. Jeff is from Seattle and has more than 20 years in product development experience. Uh, he is really good at trivia, but not nearly as good as Justin Inverich, who is our full stack engineer. And Justin is our reigning trivia champion at Arrivalist. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of trivia in this presentation just to spice it up a little bit. But first, We'll cover the topics we're going to cover today. How important is visualization? I'll give you my perspective on that. And uh, obviously, <laughs> this is a self-selecting audience. So obviously, you care about visualization as well. But I'd like to give you my take on just how important it is and what we've learned over the last few years. Secondly, how do charts tell stories? I think it's a, it's a quick uh, deep dive into storytelling with charts. But it's one that I've uh, been distilling over the past... 11 years, and I, I hope you'll find some some value in it. We'll talk about, uh, Bala's going to talk about visualization best practices. These are things you can use in your day-to-day -day activities um, at work and as you create charts for your data. Jeff's going to talk about putting those concepts into action. And as we all know, putting product into action is nothing without putting action into code. So Justin's going to talk about turning uh, turning our products into, into code. So we're going from concept to execution today. But first, a challenge. So get, uh, open up the chat section of your, or the Q&A section. And the first two enters, um, the answer to this question wins. So... <laughs> Um, this is just a little challenge, something I've wondered for, for a long time. Lots of things have inventors, the light bulb has an inventor, you know, many, uh, the typewriter has an inventor, many, all these things have an inventor, but who is credited with inventing the first chart? Was it no one, no one particular person It just kind of evolved out of data? Was it William Playfair? Was it Thomas Edison with over 10,000 patents? Was it Joseph Priestley or was it the Massachusetts Institute of Technology? So just type your answer in to the chat. Who's got an answer on the Q&A? I've got one answer for E. Oh, all right. Now we're populating. Now we're populating MIT. No one in particular. William Playfair, the correct answer. And I know some, uh, hey, Descartes, nice. Fascinating, getting some good, getting some good write-in answers. I would expect no less from a, from a group of researchers. That's awesome. So might be disputed. Some would say William Playfair, but if you go chronologically, the answer is Joseph Priestley. This is what many regard to be the first chart. Joseph Priestley in the late 1700s created this chart of all the great thinkers, when they lived and what they contributed to the world of thought. And this is often credited with the uh, with being the first chart ever ever published. To be fair, William Playfair took it to a whole nother level, but this is widely regarded to be the first chart. And the one point I want to make from this chart is that the original chart 
told a story. In fact, the first, the very first charts tell great stories. And how does that happen? How could you say a chart, data plotted a, on a screen, tells a story? What's the real essential tension here is how do computers or data driven entities communicate with people? And how do we tra best translate data into stories? So the best, I, I, I'm fond of saying that stories are the fabric of human memory. And stories, in order to be remembered, have to have, uh, well, what is a story anyway? I would posit that a story has three characteristics. It's three things, very simply. I, did, I was an English major briefly. I'm not an authority on the subject, but it, in my story time as an English major, I realized that stories have characters. Now, a character in your story could be any number of things. A character could be an origin mark, market. A character could be hotel tax revenue. A, a character could be consumer sentiment. Um, characters are usually known before they're charted, but a story is characters in conflict over time. Pretty simple. Two characters in conflict over time. So um, how would we chart characters in conflict over time? Well, let's start with one of our first charts at Arrivals. Now, I'm not going to tell you this is a great chart. In fact, I, when we first launched Daily Travel Index, I showed a chart like this to my nine-year-old son, and he said, Dad, I said, what do you think? I was so proud. And he said, Dad, it looks like a bunch of scribble scrabble. Uh, later, I overheard him telling a friend, oh, uh, a friend said, what does your dad do? And he said, oh, my dad sells pictures of scribble scrabble. And I, at that point, I realized I really needed to upgrade our visualization. But this is the type, this is one of the first charts we ever built at Arrivalus. And what you'll notice here that there are two characters. Two characters are ad exposures, which are something our clients control, and visitors, which is something our clients would like to control, but don't. So there's an essential tension between the ad exposures and the characters. Of course, these characters are in conflict over time. And so if you watch the little scribble scrabble, the wavy line, you'll notice that there's a big burst of ad exposures and an ensuing burst in arrivals and a burst in ad exposures and an ensuing burst in arrivals. And then at the end of the period, the ad exposures go flat. Why is that? Now, this is the city of New Orleans. They market during the summer months and they market this summer, they market that summer, they market that summer. We were able to show that they had as they increased in exposures, they increased arrivals, and they were able to win more budget. They were able to flatten the curve of impressions because now they were marketing perennial, perennially. They were marketing year round. So we helped them make the case they should market year round. And that's how these characters conflicted over time. And this is the resolution of that story. So this is just one chart. I'm sure we'll have a lot more, but this is one chart that exemplifies how stories, how characters change um, over time. Now, at Arrivalist, we spent the last three to four years focusing on data and just doubling down on data. And I've, I think it's a good thing that we did. We built 48 or more charts in our reporting platform. And three years ago, we embarked on a journey to rebuild visualization. We learned a lot from that process. So what I'd like to share with you is uh, what we'd like to share with you today is what we learned from that process. Um, so, and a last personal thing on mine, I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, visualization is to data what bottles are to perfume. When you take away the bottle, what are you left with? You left with a bunch of aformation, <laughs> um, formless, um, smelly water. <laughs> But if you put it in the right bottle, a perfume can be something kind of kind of life changing. So um, that's my that's my last pontification on data. And now I'm gonna I, I want to celebrate the people who helped us build a horizon, three of whom we're featuring here today. Um, and so I, I so it's with much appreciation for these people that I hand it over to Paula, who's going to talk about data storytelling and, and give some examples. And then we'll talk about how we put data storytelling to work in building uh, Horizon. So over to you, Bella. Thank you, Craig. 
Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, so when Chris said, you know, we had to put together kind of like the principles of data storytelling, I honestly didn't know that if I can cover it in one hour, much less in 20 minutes, but I'm going to try. Um, what we want, what I wanted to show today is kind of adding to what Chris said, why stories matter. Um, and we're going to talk about some principal concepts that we are using as we're thinking about our presentations, our visualizations, our horizon platform. Um, the concepts that I'm going to show you today are basics, like so 101. On top of that, we are learning um, a lot. <laughs> like, like Chris said, I'm, I'm reading through a bunch of books. I'm going to share some of the books that I'm reading uh, so that you guys can read those as well. And, and just trying to learn, learn more and more on how we can make our presentations, our insights, so much more clear that clients take actions right away. Um, I used to be the one that used to create 50 slide decks and used to be proud of it. Um, I used to go into a meeting and talk for one hour and say, you know, hey, here's what the data told us, right? And at the end of the day, I realized that not many clients were taking actions from the data because it took a while for them to understand what those 50 slides meant, right? So I started kind of paring my slides down to three to five and really having more conversations on how we can use one insight or two insights and take clear action from the data. So I'm gonna share some examples from our clients. Some are example data, everything that I've used here is not real, um, but I do wanna share examples of visualizations that have had a positive impact on our clients. So we're going to talk about knowing your audience. This is very, very important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about choosing the right visual. And we're going to kind of go on a journey together. Um, we're going to look at a chart. We're going to look at a problem. And we're going to solve it in sequential steps and seeing what we ended up with. Right. And finally, I have a surprise in the end. That's called Bing, Bang, Bongo. I'm a firm believer of Bing, Bang, Bongo. I'll explain what it is towards the end. Um, but it's a concept that we all know, we all cherish, but we don't often use it in our presentations. And this has made a huge impact on how um, the stories or how the insights kind of resonate in our client's mind after the meeting, right? Um, first, why stories matter, right? So we all know the stories. We all know the Rapunzel, the Aladdin, the Alice in Wonderland there is something magical about a story, right? And apart from the characters and conflict over time, they grab your attention, right? Stories kind of evoke an emotional response, right? You feel for the characters, you want the good guys to win, you got want the bad guys to lose, right? So there is an emotional response that is involved. They also kind of make things a little bit more memorable, right? Um, so you remember more about the stories rather than hey, my campaign was 0.65% more effective than my other campaign, right? You're not going to remember the numbers as much. And finally, it makes it easier to repeat, right? So as we were looking at things, right, at the end of the meeting, you want, again, we want our clients to go in and repeat at least one or two things to someone who wasn't in a meeting and in a crisp and clear to understand manner, right? So we wanted to kind of change how we do presentations into good storytelling. So the purpose of today and what I'll cover mostly is how we can perhaps use different visualizations to convey a meaningful story. Um, and like I said, hopefully we reduce the 50 page reports to three to five. It's not gonna happen immediately. In fact, it went from 50 to 30 for me, then 30 to 10 and 10 to maybe five now. It, it's a gradual change, right? But the changes that we're gonna make uh, are gonna have a meaningful impact um, on the actions that we want our clients to take. So this is something that I kind of look at, you know, many, every, anybody can excel, you know. Um, I've seen a lot of people pull really good insights. And I've only seen very few people do really good presentations that are memorable, right? you can build those lasting stories, right? So that's what we wanna be. We're probably somewhere in the middle right now. So we wanna 
be in a position where we're creating lasting stories, right? Um, here are some of the books. I, I'm just putting it right out there. If, if there are people that want to read it or screenshot it, I've read the first two in here. Um, the next two is in, on my reading list. I also follow these authors on LinkedIn where they share um, some of the excerpts from their book, uh, which I found valuable. Um, I sometimes repurpose their visualization, right? And, and I strongly believe in imitation is the sincerest form of flattery here. Uh, but do give it a thought. Storytelling with data is kind of how my journey started. Now it's kind of evolving more into what are the other things that I can learn. So let's start with the core concept of knowing your audience, right? So before we start a presentation or a report, right? Can we answer the basic question? Who's your audience, right? Is it a data analyst, media agency, or a marketing manager? No, I don't believe it or not, each person uh, is going to want to see data differently. It's the combination, right? Understanding this will kind of help you understand their emotional need. So, you know, write it down. Um, who's going to be in this meeting, right? And what do you need them to do? Do you want them to take an action? Do you want to have a conversation? Um, the one thing I always tell myself is, and it's important, is when you're presenting, you are the subject matter expert, right? which means that you're in a very, very unique position to interpret the insights in a way that can help them understand, perhaps like Chris said, 40 different reports. And you can come condense that to five slides, five insights that they can understand. That's on you, right? So you, you hold a huge responsibility. And finally, the you know how you communicate does have an impact in person or a phone call. I tend to put more text uh, when it comes to phone calls because you know, people or, or Zoom meetings because people tend to, you know, forget what I said. You know, hey, let me see what he's writing on the on the on the slide. Whereas in person, I can be more visual, right? I can talk about it, I can have more conversation, I can see the reactions of someone who's understanding the slide or, or is not, right? So those are the small minor changes that I make depending on how I communicate, right? So Let's take a real world example. Um, there was a tourism organization, a DMO that came to us and said, you know, hey, you know, I've been doing this for the last 10 years. I'm trying to convince my stakeholders to do more out of state marketing, right? And I've shown data before. I've shown it from surveys. I've shown yeah, data from Google Analytics, um, but the stakeholders aren't convinced. Um, so they signed up with Arrivalist to prove one, their assumption is valid. And she said, I want to have a simple to understand visualizations. I, I don't understand these complicated reports, right? So I said, okay, can you give me 10 minutes with you before I put anything on the paper, right? I said, absolutely. Help me understand these stakeholders. Who are they? And she said, well, eight out of 10 are hotel owners, okay? And as we were talking, we got to realize that hotel tax revenue represented a majority of their uh, revenue, right? And why are they not taking actions is because, or they're, they're not saying convinced yet, is because they're seeing more Floridians in the destination and said, okay. And in the past, the, we have presented a lot of data and, and, and they're not so much into the data, okay? So we took this particular um, challenge and we said, okay, we're going to make you this one slide. I'd like you to present this one slide with all the caveats, all the context that you can provide before and after and tell me how it worked out. So what we did was we looked at people who stayed overnight in the destination and compared them to people who stayed overnight in a hotel, right? And the reason we did that is we know that hotel again, evokes that emotional response in those stakeholders, right? Eight out of 10 are hotel owners. And what we're going to look at is simply the 10 top 10 markets changing ranks. We're not going to even go into share. We're not talking about percentages. We're not talking about any numbers. We're simply looking at, is this your top market for someone who's staying in the destination? Is this the same top market for someone who's coming to the destination and staying in a hotel? And we started kind of going through these uh, different Florida DMAs. And we started seeing that some of them were dropping share. And the first impact here was that New York was number two in terms of people coming in and staying in a hotel. And then as we traversed through this, we started seeing more and more of these green lines 
of out of state markets popping up like Atlanta. We started seeing DC coming up. We started seeing Chicago coming up in top 10. And we said, you know, look at the top 12 markets. Top six have shifted in ranks in terms of, uh, you know, uh, who's staying in a destination versus hotels. Of course, you're seeing more people coming in from Florida and the destination, but if you're looking purely at people staying in a hotel, there's ample opportunities for us to go in and target these, um, these out-of-state markets. And this resulted in an action. This resulted, this gave our client the ammunition to go to a, uh, a board meeting and present this and, and take action, right? So that's kind of like what we're going to talk about throughout is how can we make the insights much more meaningful, evoke an emotional response, make it easier for people to go in and uh, repeat that. In fact, the six out of 12 was something that was repeatable even after the meeting. And I always say this a little bit, uh, humanize the data, <laughs> actions will follow, right? Um, people love a David and Goliath battle, right? So people want to compare themselves to their competitors. They want to compare you know, against past performance. And your client is the hero of your story, right? How are they winning against I mean, it's all the adversities that they have? And, and we kind of use dull colors for the villains throughout and bright colors for the heroes. And you'll see that throughout this presentation that I did. Um, just one more uh, importance on like why knowing your audience is important, right? So I've, pre I've presented this a lot. Um, I've presented brand lift studies and I've said, here's your control group arrival rate. I'm, I'm using a PAC ad today because, you know, I don't want to share the client's name, but usually this is the client's, um, you will have clients creative in here, but I'd say here's your control arrival rate, you know, about 0.40%. Here's your target arrival rate for 0.60%. And this is 50% left, right? And mostly I would expect oohs and ahs at this time because, hey, our creatives and our marketing is getting more people into the into the destination right and most of the time I used to get like oh okay 50 percent is that good is that bad right and I don't understand how to repeat 0.4 and 0.6 to a stakeholder right so that's why I said humanize the data is not be everyone will understand the graphs not anyone will understand the rates right so you want to make it a little bit more meaningful so I started recreating that particular slide into, hey, of someone who's in your control group that didn't see your ads, for every thousand people, four people arrived. And for someone that did see your ads, six people arrived. So your marketing actually was 1.5 times more effective than a control group. All right. You can take numerous inferences from this. Your marketing generated two additional incremental revenue arrivals from it, right? But this is something that's easy for people to go and repeat, easy for people to understand. You don't need to understand what those bars mean. You don't need to understand what those axes mean. You don't need to understand what arrival rate means, right? All you need to understand is your marketing had an impact, and this is the impact. So next, we're going to talk about choosing an effective visual. Hopefully, I've already given you some uh, insight into you know, different visuals you're using. I'm going to talk about more and more of how you can take simple visuals and turn them into somewhat of a good storytelling, right? Just adding a little bit of a, a creative design to it, right? So I'm not going to go through all of this. You have ample number of visual displays available. You have simple text, cat report, table, lines, bar graphs, heat. You can have different types of bar graphs, right? Um, stacked, um, horizontal, vertical, waterfall, even square area, right? But taking something like text, right? I, I want to show you one again, one effective way of using visualization. So we took something as a text visual, right? And we added a design layer to it just to show a client how different seasons impacted their uh, visit visitation share, right? And here's how we did it. Yes, you can see it's not a big bar graph or anything like that. I could have put in a single single bar graph. But here what we did was we took a simple text, you know, what is a share and how long are they staying in the destination? And we just did a nice little graphic that represented the different seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall 
for people to kind of take a screenshot or even take this particular slide and put it in their board meeting, right? Uh, because it's easy for people to see and, and, and resonate with those imageries. We, I always also look at different uh, visual, uh, visuals that are just not common, but are available in the marketplace and have made an impact. And this is again, not a rival list, but this is from Stephanie Evergreen. She made what is called as a proportion chart. And I love this for a few reasons, right? What you're seeing on the screen is on the left is the share of population by demographic. On the right is share of women owned businesses by the same demographics. So even though there's 14% um, African-American population, you can see that jumping up to 42%. And the headline says, women of color launch the vast majority of new business and black women lead the charge, right? And things to like here is that it put focuses, it focuses on those three major demographics that represents women of color. And honestly, if I were doing this for the first time, I might have put in every single demographic in here, right? But see how she kind of combined all the others into one bucket. Because what we want to focus on is these three personas. And all the others can be combined into one, right? So don't be afraid to look at your visualization and say, what is not necessary? What is not adding value to my statement, my insight that I've put right up there, right? And the other thing to note here is the dull colors that are being used for all others and a little bit of a brighter colors used for the other, uh, other demographics, again, highlighting the insight that we want the audience to see. Um, here's another one that we did uh, for, uh, for marketing. Again, it's a simple, you know, a lollipop chart or slope graph or range plot. Um, there's some different names for it. But what this shows is hotel revenue per arrival versus vacation rental revenue per arrival. And we're simply showing that vacation rental um, visitors spend more per every visitor that come into the destination, right? Even if I didn't have any numbers in this particular chart, you would still be able to see that range. You would still be able to make the same inferences that I did without having those numbers. And that's what sometimes I aim to do is, can I tell the same story without the numbers, right? So the third concept that we're going, so we went into two concepts. One is knowing your audience, Another one is choosing the right visual, and I've shown you some snippets of it. We're gonna do a lot more of those different visuals throughout the next 10 minutes that I have. Um, but the one thing I try to do a lot is the clutter, right? What is clutter? Clutter is anything that's taking up a lot of visual space, but don't increase our understanding, right? Um, so anything where if it's there, you get an ugh moment, right? Anything that makes the chart look a little bit more complicated than if than it needs to be, right? And I always talk about this cognitive load, which is like, you know, picture this blank screen, right? Anything that I add in here, your brain is going to immediately look at this, right? And say, um, oh, what is that? I'm going to read through that, right? So imagine, and again, this is all examples, but imagine you're presenting revenue increases year over year, right? And you have this, again, from a charting standpoint, you've done excellent, right? You have the labels, you have the axis, you have the legend, you have the colors, you have the variety, right? Um, but the numbers in here are, there are almost 10, 15 numbers to look at. Someone looking at that is not going to be able to understand what is 9, 8, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. And is that 10, 2, 6, 5, right? I'm reading through those numbers and I'm missing the story. And the, miss the story here and the insight here is our revenue increased. The story insight is very, very simple. The same chart, same result can be achieved by doing something like this. We can even make it much more clear on this, but this is a very simple example of me selling you 9.8, 10.3. That's the same inferences that you're driving from the left-hand side, right? Our revenue increased. In fact, I can I can even remove the data labels and put year over year. So think about how you can remove elements that does not add any value. 
So we are going to go through an hypothetical scenario with Universal Orlando, somewhat realish because we're going to take some real, real events as well. But this was pre-pandemic. Uh, theme parks in 2019 were facing a challenging summer. So, you know, we had all these articles coming in of, of um, you know, whether theme parks market share will go down. And at that time, Universal actually announced a new Hagrid ride that was going live on June 30, right? And a client came to us and said, okay, I want to see, let's say you have your client as Universal Studios Orlando, and they came to you and said, hey, is the theme park market share really decreasing? Are we actually, you know, starting this at the wrong time, right? And you went in and you pulled all the data and you said, oh, is there a drop in theme park visitors this summer? Uh, let us look at Magic Kingdom's market share on the left. Let's look at Universal Studios market share on the right. Hey, look, Hagrid Ride actually launched and it increased, right? From an insight standpoint, the numbers are correct. From a visual storytelling standpoint, I think there's a lot more we can do to make this a little bit more clear, right? For example, you know, we can think about do we need two different charts? And this is how you kind of start to declutter, right? So do we need those two different charts? Do we need an access label? What are these? you know, access me, right? What do these colors represent? Why are there two different colors, right? What did Hagrid Wright do? Yes, we said Hagrid Wright launched, but what did it do? And is this the right title, right? So we're gonna take a little bit of a step-by-step -step approach to kind of declutter this. So let's do step one. We're gonna combine both of them into one chart and we're just gonna share Orlando's market share Magic Kingdom is blue, universal screen. Now we're gonna remove those data markers that we had in there. Um, so all those big uh, circles, so we remove that. Then we're gonna remove grid lines. And I'm a strong believer that sometimes we don't need the grid lines. Very rarely we need grid lines, right? We're gonna keep things a little bit more clear, right? So now we're gonna add up the access labels on the left. So you can see proportion of Orlando visitors, arrival month, and now we're gonna add a little bit of a chart description, like a chart title. Hey, this is what this particular chart shows. And now we're gonna clean up the data labels. And now when I say clean up the data labels, look at all these different data labels that we have in here. How many numbers do they have to look at before they get to this 15 magical number that we want them to look to, right? So we're gonna really focus in on the last three months. This is the challenging summer month, right? These are not the challenging summer months. So we're going to only going to go look at these three. Now, immediately, the one thing that happens throughout this chart is when you remove all of this, your first attention goes to the first number here. Not here, but here, right? Now we're going to add a little bit of a, a thing that you can do is you don't need to have legends all the time. You can actually add the legends as a data label or you can label it directly. Um, so this is Magic Kingdom, and you can see that I'm using a dull color for Magic Kingdom because Universal Studios is our account, right? Now we're keeping Universal Studios in green. And finally, we're going to add our own narrative to it, which says, hey, look at this uh, new Hagrid Ride cluster that actually launched in June that caused an increase in Universal's market share while we're seeing a decrease in Magic Kingdom, right? So imagine how we started. We started with this and we ended with this, right? And that's what we wanna do with decluttering is try to think about how can we make this most positive as well as how can we get to the insights faster? So I've kind of, revi uh, kind of reviewed everything here um, and, I'm, and I have five minutes, so I'm gonna go a little bit quicker. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about colors and animations, right? So. Colors are your best friend to tell your story powerful, right? It's a powerful tool that you can use to tell and draw your audience's attention, right? Everything stands out against gray. So I usually use gray for contrast. Um, and I also try and keep in mind that there are people that are colorblind, even I'm colorblind, partially colorblind. So I try to keep things a little bit varied in terms of colors. I don't use, you know, blue and darker blue and or certain things like that, right? And also be careful of the tone that the color represents. If you're in Canada like me, red is positive. Red is your 
you know, can, yeah, it's our Canadian flag and it's, it's red everywhere here, but red also signifies a decrease in the US, right? So for, for certain um, negative numbers, right? So think about your audience and what color means to them, right? So here's an example of a, of a museum client that we did who increased um, their, uh, their closing hours in, on Thursdays. So you can see this is the Art Institute of Chicago. They, uh, they actually, instead of closing at 6 p.m., they closed at 8.30 now. And they wanted to see if that made an impact in terms of stealing share away from other museums. And if I put color on every single day of the week, the story is kind of submerged in there somewhere, right? So what, I, what we did was we simply said, okay, by increasing the closing hours on Sun Thursday, Art Institute was able to steal more share from other museums and attractions. And what we did was we made everything else gray and we simply pointed out the Thursday. And now you can clearly see that Art Institute was number one in terms of share on Thursdays. And that's what we mean by using colors appropriately, right? Similar to colors, you can also use animations to tell the story appropriately. And this is one story we told at a conference recently. We had two characters, a hotel and a vacation rental, right? You can see the blue is vacation rental, green is hotel. And I want to tell this without putting any numbers on that particular stack bar chart, right? So we said, Hey, vacation rental revenue represented less than 40% of Austin's overnight lodging revenue in 2019. And as we traversed through the pandemic, we saw that that increased to 75%. And now we were looking to understand at what point do we reach the steam stability? And in Q1 2021, we saw the first time ever that the hotel was on par with vacation rental revenue. And finally, when we got to Q4 of 2021, it's the first time we saw that the hotel's share of overnight revenue was consistent with what we saw before pandemic. Um, just like colors can hurt, if you had crazy animations like this, and I've, believe me, I've kind of played around with this a lot, and I've always thought the more you animate, the better. These can also hurt your narrative, right? People are just always looking around. And finally, you know, I promised you what's Bing Bang Bongo. Uh, one of the core concepts that I use throughout this presentations as well is it's a very simple concept of repeating the same insight again and again in a presentation. So it's kind of like the, the concept is you start with the Bing Bang Bongo. When you're talking about the Bing, you're still talking about the Bing Bing, Bing Bang, Bing Bongo. And then you have the bang, you have the bongo, and conclusion is also telling you the same thing. Think about how the stories have affected our livelihood, right? We hear the stories again and again and again and again and again. And now we know the stories by heart. We know we've seen, uh, we can tell what's going to happen to those characters. We know what's the turning point. And sometimes it might feel like you are doing redundant slides or redundant insights. It's redundant for you because you're going through the same presentation again and again. It's a reminder for your client every single time they see it. So, hey, we saw that arrival lift was 50% on the first slide. Here we see that arrival lift again was 50%. Hey, in the end, remember our arrival lift was 50%. So the more they hear this particular insight throughout the presentation, more likely they're gonna remember after the meeting. What did you learn from the meeting? Oh, arrival lift was 50%. Uh, so I think we, we did pretty good, right? With that, I'm gonna have the summary, right? I have to do, after a bing bang bongo, I can't do, not do summaries, but know your audience, choose the right visual. We went through a process of decluttering, which is very basic, but I do want you to think about your graphics in that format use the colors and animations appropriately. They are a very powerful tool. If you don't know what to do with colors, I usually, what I do is I make everything gray and start and say, what insight do I want to tell? And start to pick out those insights and really turn them into bright green, right? And finally, bing bang bongo, because repetition can help you really cement your stories in the client's mind. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to hand it off to you. Great. Thanks, Bob.
right. So, um, what Ballas touched on is what we endeavor to do with our own products. And we've put thousands of hours and over the last couple of years working to understand how we take uh, a business that at one point was uh, had an audience that was very data heavy, uh, meaning data scientists, and just give me the data and I'll slice it myself. Uh, that has changed now and it's more equal uh, with data scientists and uh, equally weighted toward marketers that are trying to make decisions uh, about how to spend money and and bring people to their destinations. We still have a lot of data scientists that, that use our data, but you, you've got to speak to people in their own language. Uh, and so um, we started with, and this is a subset of, of things, and, and Bala already touched on many of these, right? Um, but you know, in, in speaking to people in their in the language that they speak, right? You have to present data in, in, in different ways, right? So textual summaries, which using natural language is, is one way, right? Somebody might prefer to read something instead of see it in a graph. A lot of people, uh, and where our, you know, we've invested heavily as well, is how do you use the concepts, concepts that Bala just spoke to to create the best graphs and maps and charts and, and rankings that allow people to not only be told a story, but interpret and understand that story completely and cleanly. Um, and then, you know, there's a hybrid model too, right? You have a platform uh, that is SaaS-like in, in design where maybe they don't want to download a big file and cut it themselves. They don't want to look at a chart, but they want to be able to manipulate the data in your platform. So how do they make real-time queries and update those charts by, um, you know, allowing them a certain flexibility in their experience? Um, and how do you allow one insight to extend a story from a previous insight? Right, so we we have a, a an interface that has a scrolling design, right? So you see it metrics at the top and insights and charts and graphs and maps and rankings below. But how does one flow to the next? So that's always a challenge, um, but that's what we endeavor to do, right? So how do you put it all in one place, right? So you don't have to use separate logins, you don't have to go to separate sites. You're everything's in one place so that you can mentally stitch these stories together, which is what Bala was touching on. Uh, earlier as it relates to um, letting it all make sense and removing the clutter and making it easy to understand. So we've invested really heavily uh, in that narrative. You're going to have to make assumptions about who your audience is. Uh, that's just about listening. It's about knowing your customer. It's about being out and talking to them uh, on a rec recursive basis. Uh, but you have to be bold enough to make those assumptions and then uh, you know, humble enough to, to modify them if the data that you're looking at and user experience metrics tell you a different story. So that's something we're always looking at as well. Um, we've tried um, foundationally to limit the number of input selections people make on platform. So if you give them 20 opportunities to make a selection, um, how does that hierarchically you know, affect what they're seeing? It might be confusing. So we, we try very hard to limit it to four or five at a maximum so that it can be very easy to understand um, any change that they're making in the platform and how that affects what they're seeing visually. Um, so we are data, vis data visualization first. That's where we've invested a lot over the last couple of years. That's our, what our Horizon platform is all about. It's about seeing uh, the data. You know, we, have, we in ingest data with lots of zeros after it, uh, but you're not supposed to care about that. You're just supposed to care about are the results easy to understand are, and are all the results accurate, right? And so that's where we tried to focus, right? So data visualization. A couple of years ago, and this is this is our DMOs are our clients. We we saw data like this being communicated out to the public and to the stakeholders to our customers. And this is how they speak, not only uh, in terms of how money is being spent, but of what's important, right? So what's important? Jobs are important uh, based on tourism dollars. And you know how do you? Uh, increase the length of stay for folks. And, you know, these these are big, in-your-face, bold metrics that you take downstream. Bala touched on this earlier. Where is the data or the visualizations in this case, where are those going to go after they leave your platform? And in many respects, it's they're going to download the PNG and they're going to put that in a slide and they're going to present to stakeholders. And they these big, in-your-face kind of metrics that are summarized are what allow people to make 
decisions and start conversations and drill down on certain areas and ultimately uh, allow them to make investments that generate in hopefully increased tourism, increased hotel stays, increased vacation rental stage and increased spend in the market, right? So these are the types of things we help try to help generate. We don't even participate in all these that are on the screen, but we do try um, to put big in your face metrics uh, in front of you so that you can understand what does the trend look like? What are the dollars associated with? How long are people staying, for example? How much money per person do we, per visit is, is generated? Um, how does the, the trend look like over time? Um, what, you know, where does it, where does a trend stand out, right? Where is there red in this case, or at least in the US example that Paula spoke to, um, you know, uh, what should I pay attention to where something is decreased, where I didn't expect it to, where is something increased reflecting something that we have done is, is working, right? Um, many people like to see things on maps and hover over them and say, oh, well, um, show me on a map where people are aggregating and spending money or spending time or staying in hotels or staying in vacation rentals, those types of things. So we try to speak to people through big metrics, through textual narrative, through art charts and graphs, through rankings, uh, through maps, because when we did our research, when we completely repositioned our company uh, to focus on data visualization and being able to tell the stories with these data, that's what we heard, right? That's how people want to see things. Uh, they want to speak their own language, and be told stories that are easy to understand. And ultimately, the most important thing is that stories that are actionable. So some of the natural text summaries that we output right here um, were just a simple ranking of the top three, not the top 50. This touches on what Paula mentioned earlier. Where are we drawing people's attention? Well, the biggest mover, the most important thing. Uh, draw attention to the most, you know, the most, uh, the, the, the venue with the biggest delta or the biggest change, right? Um, who are the people that are staying longer? Uh, and so we try to speak in, in text, in graphs, in charts, and in summaries. Some people might uh, you know, look at our platform and they might uh, prefer to see charts like this or rankings like this. Just tell me what's the highest and what's the lowest and allow me to see the top 10, top 50, top 100 if I want to. Somebody might prefer a visual like this that says, okay, people that arrive in Denver spend a lot of time at a certain place. Like these are not our people that are going to Red Rocks Amphitheater. This is the same type of data visualized in a different way. And we, we give them a choice, um, or in most cases, we attempt to give them a choice or let them pick their own flavor. Um, again, we don't know what's happening downstream. We don't know how the person viewing it uh, prefers to visualize it. And we don't know how their stakeholders prefer to visualize it. So we try to give them a choice. Some people prefer this, right? Uh, so give me a matrix like this so that I can understand it in this way. Other people might prefer a map. Show me where people are coming from. I want it by zip code. I want it by DMA. I want it by state. Let them choose that flavor. And that's a, to, to a degree, you attempt to be uh, an ice cream shop to, with limitations, right? You don't want 500 flavors, but you don't want just one, right? So give it to them in ways that they uh, in, in the language that they speak or, or the language they might want to talk about. This, more, more succinct, more basic. Some people prefer to see data like that. Some people just want, get, you know, give me a file. I will put it into uh, my platform of choice and I will you know, become a data wrangler and I will cut it and slice it however I want. So give them that too, because that is on one hand, it's transparent. On the other hand, we may not, have sliced the data or presented the data exactly what they want. So give them that choice. Um, we work hard at putting big, bold KPIs front and center, very top of our platform uh, so that people can act on this stuff. So this is you know, similar to one of my first slides where our customers, a DMO, might care about things that matter to them and help them tell stories and justify decisions and make new decisions. Um, it allows us to separate data out into uh, very easy and, and easy to understand uh, graphs and charts. This one happens to be uh, hotels and vacation rentals on top and then visiting friends and relatives, which is just another way of saying everybody else in the third. But you can very easily see, you know, most people stay in hotels. This is where vacation rentals come in and this is how everybody else stays. Um, 
and you know let them let them take things with them right and so trust is earned uh, in this case you can take this particular chart and you can say give me the csv and the data behind it give it to me in excel give me a high resolution png so i can put it in my own powerpoint give me a pdf and so we try to give them a choice how are how are people going to use this data and these visuals after they leave our platform because as Bala touched on we spend a lot of time working toward making them the hero our customer the hero and allowing them to succeed in what they endeavor to do with the data which is either to you know react to something that hasn't gone right uh, justify something that has or continue to invest in new ways based on what the data tells them and again this is a, a repeat from a prior slide and what Bala uh, mentioned as well uh, give them something that allows them to draw their attention to things that matter. In this case, right, December 2022 doesn't look great. Draw your attention to it. What happened in December 2022? What can we do about it? How, what can we learn from it? Uh, you might not always have causality as the publisher of the data, but you can make the assumptions that your customers downstream are intelligent and that they know what to do. And then know when to break apart data. Right, so again, this is um, you know a local traveler or somebody that lives in market versus a visitor, somebody that has come uh, has come from out of town. In this case, likely flown in the Denver International Airport. Right, and so you want to understand uh, how to break apart data based on what's important to your customer. So you might behave dif differently, or invest differently, or market differently toward local people versus people that are flying in. So know how to break apart data in an intelligent way to best tell the story. And then side-by-sides, year-over-year um, stuff that Bala mentioned uh, with the colors and the gray here, uh, to reiterate that, you can see very clearly um, a, a local versus a visitor and the differences in behavior. So again, just, just how to tell stories uh, with data and break apart data and then putting them side-by-side -side can also be very helpful. So uh, my summary, similar to Bala's, know your audience, uh, know how they want to tell stories to their stakeholders, give them flavors to choose from, keep it clean and easy. Another way of saying clutter is your enemy to reiterate Bala. Uh, allow the stories that you tell to be obvious, be transparent uh, because trust is earned and then continually bid, build and add new features to your platform based on the, the, the feedback that you get from whoever your customer is. And we all endeavor to do that. So that's, uh, that's what I have. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Justin, who is going to talk you through uh, um, an engineering perspective. Justin? Hey, everyone. I'm Justin. I'm on the engineering team in, uh, here at Arrivalist. And I just wanted to briefly kind of touch on some of the uh, like technical aspects of you know, our decision making for, um, for visualizations. So you know, here at Arrivalist, we ingest over 10 billion data points daily from our data providers. And on any given day, we analyze over 14 trillion data points. This leads to having petabytes of data available, um, but the real question is, is, how do you find the signal and noise that solves your client's needs? Uh, in that case, we employ powerful clustering, attribution, visitation, and trip models that are unique to Arrivalist that we've been developing over for many years to distill that raw data into something usable that powers our visualizations. Um, next slide, please, Jeff. Um, here's some of our guiding design principles, really, is that, you know, our clients have many unique wants, but it boils down to sort of an underlying need. What do I do now with the resources that I have? And our job here when we're designing our visualizations is to hone in on what matters in a visually appealing way by finding a balance between images, words, and numbers without sacrificing visual clarity and simplicity. And as you can see, you know, we've made strides when you can see some of the examples that Jeff and Bala have already shown. Um, we've made investments in new data sources, warehouses, data models, and libraries that allow us to present rich data visualization that is responsive to what our clients care about, and importantly, it use in an easy manner. Um, we also strive to minimize how much a user is going to have to really think about what is they want. Um, you know, it's like you should be able to just access these visualizations and just get the insights that you care about right away. And of course, it just it turns it turns into a continuous development and iteration. It's a continuous process, 
of improvement in terms of design and usability. But ultimately, our goal is how do we get our clients the data that they need in a way that they understand it the best? Um, and that leads that informs us for how we go about structuring and creating these visualizations and, you know, delivering them to you in a performant manner. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Uh, I'm going to pass it all, pass it to Cree now. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. I know we've run a little bit long here. We're open for uh, some questions for the next couple of minutes. If you have any, I uh, promise we weren't trying to avoid the questions. We're just pretty passionate about this, and we get into the subject matter. Thanks for the update, um, uh, Justin. We did have one question come in through the Q&A uh, regarding our control groups. Um, uh, well, do our control groups include the exposed uh, exposed users as well. And I, I want to point out that when we uh, when we run an analysis, we only look at devices that we know were exposed and devices that we did not see any exposures on. I, I wish I could say that there was such a thing as a pristine control group. In other words, uh, it's really impossible to say that a device or a person has a person has never seen an ad. All we can control is the devices that we know have seen ads and the devices that we did not record any exposures for. Um, so we are only comparing uh, knowingly exposed devices to devices that we did not record any exposures to. To answer that question directly, we were also asked, well, you know, were there only two incremental visitors from the exposed group and um, uh, we wouldn't report that if if our total uh, if we only had six uh, a panel of six. What we're doing there, to Bella's point, is decluttering it, pushing it together. So uh, we likely had um, thousands of um, exposed users arriving, and thousands, if not tens of thousands, of unexposed users arriving. Um, so we we were just simplifying for the sake of of explanation. Any other questions, comments? Uh, thanks for thanks for everybody for the nice words. Uh, getting some nice words in the chat. It's always great to reconnect with our with our clients and thank you for the compliments. And yes, this will be recorded. Uh, so you can share this uh, with some peers. And uh, it's great to reconnect with all you colleagues. Please don't be shy about reaching out with us. Look out for more Horizon announcements today. We sent out a client email today. We got more fun stuff coming. And uh, thanks to the team for the presentation. And thank you to TTRA for being informed for, for this exchange. And next time we'll make it half as long. <laughs> uh, maybe not twice as informative, but half as long. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.